did have some good bits, and they were all books, as anticipated. So let's make a big list of them. Hi guys, it's Leanne, and welcome to the Unrivaled Gush Fest that I look forward to every single year. It is the least salty video in all of my content. And of course I'm talking about my best 10 books of 2020. It will never be the top 20 or the top 21 books of 2020 or 2021. This is for a couple of reasons. The first is that if I'm going to pick an arbitrary number of books that I read that I really really liked in a year, 10 seems like a good round number. The second one is like I do not have the energy for the top 20 books or the top 20, 21 books in a year. I plan to live a really long time and who knows how long I'm going to be making videos about books. Well guys, we've finally got to the top 71 books of 2071. No. Mm -mm. And every year I'm like, okay, I have made an effort to rank these. These are roughly in the ranking of my absolute top 10. But this year, apart from the one that is coming in the number one slot, I haven't ranked any of the other ones because I just feel like ranking the actual happy bits of 2020 might be going a bit too far. So let's jump in, shall we? Yes. First on this list is a book that I'm going to talk just very, very briefly about because it is one in a massive series and that is The Wee Free Men by Terry Pratchett. This book is of course one in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. I think it is actually number 30 and of course Chronologic That is the third time I have tried to chronologically it was the last series that he actually wrote. This one is about Tiffany Aching who is a young girl who really thinks that there's nothing special about herself particularly but then one day fairies steal her brother and as far as she's concerned if anybody's gonna steal her brother and feed him to something it's going to be her. So she arms herself with a frying pan and her granny's knowledge who she is fairly sure was a witch and she goes off on a quest. This book hit me hard in a lot of ways and I think it's because despite the fact that Terry Pratchett's books, all of them including this series, are absolutely stuffed full of really wry humour, essentially what he satires is life. It's real life, it's the things that we go through all the time as humans and when Terry was writing these books he knew that he had Alzheimer's and there is a very large sense that Terry was setting the reader up for a time when he would no longer be there. The books in this particular section of his series are very philosophical, they look at dying and what you leave behind. But the thing about this book that really really hit hard with me is that Tiffany is somebody who has such low self-esteem about herself and her life. She knows she's a sensible, plain and capable girl. She has no problem with believing that she's courageous but she does have problems believing that anybody would like her or want to be around her and she spends this entire book realising that your intention is half of who you are as a person and that people will see that. And it also helps that at the end of this book we meet once again Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og who are my favourite characters from the Discworld books. So yeah, absolutely love this and also massively, massively advocate the audiobook for this series because they're great. Next up is another one that I'm not going to talk too much about because I actually gushed about it really, really recently. During the entire month of October I read spooky books and one of the spooky books that I read was of course a haunted house book that just absolutely captured me and that is The Family Plot by Sherry Priest. This one is about Dahlia who works for a company called Music City Salvage which essentially goes into old estate sales, old buildings and things and rips out the valuable parts of them that they can then resell. Music City Salvage are in a lot of trouble when Augusta Withrow walks through their door and says that she would like to sell her old family estate that she has left everything in it, they can absolutely have it, they can ransack it, all of the outbuildings are theirs, she just doesn't want to have anything else to do with it. But of course when Dahlia and her team actually get to the house they discover that things aren't that simple and that there is actually also a small graveyard outside of the house. A family plot if you will. The premise is great, the plot is wonderful, but the real amazing thing about this book is Dahlia. I often find that horror books go one of two ways, either they're really character light and you just never really get invested in people, 
Or they go the other way where everybody's a little bit despicable and so you're not really that fussed when something happens to them. So I think it's amazing when a horror book can give you a character that you can absolutely fall in love with as well as the like creepy horror stuff. And in this case, the horror stuff that was happening was kind of intrinsically linked to what was going on in Dahlia's mind and I just loved that. It was just so good, it was super spooky, it had that right mix of paranormal slash is this real going on and I was so emotionally invested in what happened to the people in this team. It was just, it was a great time. If you are looking for a haunted house book and you are new to haunted house books, I would absolutely start here. Cause like it's scary in that like I want to know what happens thing and not like I'm turning all of the lights on and I'm closing all of the curtains and I'm putting my back to a wall. At least until lovely wife Helen comes in and can rescue me. That's been the one good thing about lockdowns in 2020. I can read whatever I like that's spooky because Lovely Wife Helen is always there to hold my hand. Speaking of spooky books, when I was making this list, I came across this book on it and was like, I was sure that I read that the year previous. I was sure that I read that like such a long time ago. But no, no, it was actually in 2020. And the book that I am talking about is, of course, The Diviners by Libba Bray. The Diviners begins with Evie O'Neill, who is in a very small town. And she is very bored in this very small town. And it is the roaring 20s. And all she wants to do is go and be a flapper in the 20s in a big city. And she has a small gift, a small strange gift for being able to hold an object that somebody else has owned and get things from it. And one day she uses this talent at a party when a little bit drunk and she then has to flee. But when Evie gets to New York she discovers that her uncle runs essentially an occult museum of curiosities and is a bit of a laughing stock and that her flapper dream is not going to be quite what she hoped it was going to be because it seems to involve a lot of dead bodies. I am really funny about books that are set in the 1920s. I think they are either amazing and they completely capture the time or they're just like I wanted to be the Great Gatsby so I wrote this. Controversial opinion. I think The Great Gatsby is a terrible book. Read this instead because it's great. It gave me a group of really diverse, really different characters who were thrown together and were forced to make a found family. It gave me such satisfying character arcs. Evie is kind of a, an irredeemable little airhead when she first appears in this book and by the end of it I was just cheering her on and every decision that she made I was like yes girl you get it. it gave me such good representation and of course it then gave a huge side of massively page turning action like insanely page turning action and like a quick plot and one of the creepiest villains I have ever read ever 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 and I would have gone right on to read the next one except that that was when the pandemic was kind of picking up and in the books it was also looking at the sleeping sickness pandemic and I noped my way out of that really quickly. But this is the year that I finish this series. Mark my words. The next book that I was also quite surprised to find was on this list because I think my brain has kind of separated out everything up until April is not being part of 2020. So this was a book that I read in April and I'm so glad that I finally got to it because honestly you guys and everybody in my close circle of friends had been telling me to read this book for years. And that book is Pretty Girls by Karen Slaughter because of course it is. This book is about Claire Scott. She is now an adult with a successful life. She has a beautiful house, a wonderful architect husband. She has literally everything that she ever wanted as a child. But as a child, her older sister Julia went missing. They were in their teens, Julia disappeared and they struggled to understand the circumstances in which Julia disappeared. We'll just, we'll just put it that way to try and avoid all of the spoilers that I could potentially do by accident. I'm being really careful here. Luckily, I think I can talk about all of my favourite things about this book without actually spoiling it because my favourite things were the relationships between Claire and her sister Lydia and Claire and her mum. Karen Slaughter 
rights, sister relationships like I have never read before anywhere else. And they're filled with the complications of the fact that adult life changes you and it makes you a whole different person and sometimes that means that you have to reintroduce yourself to people that you love, in this case to your sister. Claire and Lydia's relationship in this was just amazing, it was so multi-leveled and throughout this book there's the shadow of Claire's mum who handled her sister's disappearance really badly, who has not been the best familial presence in their lives and there's this wonderful moment of Claire realising that her mother is now also a different person, that life has changed her but that people can change and people can have brilliant intentions in their life and not fulfil them but still be good people at the end of it and oh I just love this book so much. Next up on my list I have Pet by a quakey MZ. Pet tells the story of Jam who has grown up in a city where there are no more monsters. The angels came and they completely cleared out the town of corruption and in this case angels and monsters are not always strange demons, they are sometimes actual people. Jam goes to her mother's studio one day where her mother paints these massive abstract paintings and she accidentally cuts herself and bleeds onto one of her mother's paintings and from the painting this creature emerges. This creature calls itself Pet and although it looks grotesque and strange it tells Jam that it is there to hunt a monster and that her best friend is not safe. And no matter how many times I do the synopsis of that it still feels reductive because it's impossible to explain to you without reading this really amazing book how much diversity was just normalised and popped into it right from the beginning. Jam is black, she is trans and she is selectively mute. She uses sign language frequently and she only vocalises with the people that she really, really trusts. It is an entirely black cast of characters and because of that I feel like the sense of community was ramped up so much. You guys know that I love novels where place turns into character and this city very much felt like that. It meant that even the characters who were only on the page for a couple of lines felt like really familiar to you, like people that you had met on the street and that was amazing. There is a person with three parents whose relationship is not picked apart. There are characters of all ages. It's such a good book that I think I'll probably reread it this year because I listened to an audiobook and then I bought the paperback so that I could support a quakey emsy and now I'm probably, I'm probably going to read the paperback this year. So you'll probably hear me rave more about it later. Okay. The one thing more than anything else that this video is teaching me is that I have forgotten the names of every character in every one of these books and I've had to look every single one of them up. Maybe they've just been omitted with all of the other things in 2020 that I would really wish that I could forget. Yes? Do you want to talk about your favourite book of 2020? Yeah? What was it? Okay, that's good. Yeah, I like that book too. My next favourite book of 2020 was The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. So I did a five star prediction video in 2020 and I never ever came back to tell you guys which of those ratings was correct and that is because the first two books on that list made me so angry that I actually put one of them in the bin because the representation of fat people in that book was so... I will talk about it in my 2020 worst books video. I will talk about it there. But this was the third book that was in that list and honestly I picked it up and I expected nothing because it came off of the back of two really terrible DNS and I was just like oh god it's another thriller it's probably going to be okay and it was amazing it was so good and I have literally now basically bought Lisa Jill's entire backlist essentially. So the family upstairs is about Libby. She is a young woman who has a timed plan for what she wants to do for the rest of her life down to literal months that she needs to achieve things in and then she turns 21 and she is handed an envelope and in that envelope she is told that she has essentially inherited a small fortune. This small fortune is tied up in a house on Cheney Walk in London and oh, this house well, honestly, just seeing the house on Cheney Walk gives me, like, ugh. This is one of those books 
that has multiple perspectives and when it changes perspective from Libby you're like no come back because I just want to know about this and then suddenly you're so swept up in the other perspective that you forget that Libby exists and then it happens again and these three alternating perspectives in this book eventually all lock into the one story and start spinning and Oh, the revelations in this book and every time I was sure about something I was then immediately like oh no that's 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 not right at all is it? I was detective working my little booty off throughout this whole book to try and figure out what was going on and I still didn't do it I still didn't do it it was a roller coaster ride but I absolutely wholeheartedly recommend it. If you're looking for somewhere to start with thrillers, this is a good place. It may spoil you. It may spoil you for some other thrillers that you will read in the future that won't be as good, but I consider that to be a good thing. My next book up is the first non-fiction book on this list. I read less non-fiction in 2020 than in any other year ever. I've had this book on my TBR for a couple of years and I find it kind of fateful that it ended up being this year that I picked it up and that is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. So Brian Stevenson is a lawyer and this is his memoir of working in the south and founding the Equal Justice Initiative. At the beginning of this memoir Brian is this really green lawyer who's really not sure why he got into the practice of law except that he needed to do something with his life and this seemed like a good thing to do and one of his placements is in I think it's Alabama he is sent with almost no prep whatsoever to go to a death row inmate and to give him an update on his case which is essentially we haven't forgotten about you but there is no update on your case. And the entire experience that he has meeting that prisoner and learning who that person is as a person and then realising how terribly few resources there are for black men on death row, Brian's entire life changed. The Equal Justice Initiative was just a tiny, tiny office with a tiny, tiny staff, but some of the things that Brian achieved with it is just mind-blowing. I'm just so emotional talking about this book. This whole book just completely changed the way that I saw some things that I thought I was already pretty educated on and it dropped some absolute truth bombs into my life that now have changed the way that I act as a person and it's changed the way that I like seek out information as a human. It's a breathtaking book and it's a heartbreaking book but if you think if there's even an inkling that you might want to pick this up then please please do because it is so so incredibly good. Next up as a complete complete change of tone is the first romance book that I have read in years. I picked up The Duchess Deal which is the first book in Tessa Dare's Girl Meets Duke series and it blew me away. This one is about Emma Gladstone. She is a seamstress and she has a background that means that she very very much can only depend on herself for money, for lodgings, for everything. She is completely alone in life and one day she takes on a client and she makes them a wedding dress and that client then calls off her wedding and essentially refuses to pay. So Emma does the only thing that she can. She's absolutely desperate. She needs the commission for this dress that she's already spent the money for the goods to make it on and she puts on the wedding dress and marches herself to the office of the Duke who was going to be the groom. I don't even know where to start with this book. Not only was this book so incredibly funny, I laughed from the first page to the last, it was amazing, but it also was so incredibly smart that whenever I hear anybody being like, eh, romance is not really my thing, I'm like, okay, but you can tell me that after you read this book. This book has also got a lot of representation in it, which I didn't expect. There's a big discussion of disfigurement. Lord Ashbury, the Duke, he has some burn scars from the war. There is a discussion 
of the war and of PTSD. There's also discussions in here of sexual assault and consent and the type of trauma that is introduced when you have your ability to choose what happens to you taken away from you and I loved all of that. And there is a staff in this book, there is a, there's a whole staff who actually have personalities. The people who work for the Duke are whole realised people. And I love that it wasn't another one of those weird narratives where the people below stairs don't actually have feelings or aspirations in their life. The whole thing was just great. The whole thing was great. And I'm going to read the rest of the series this year because the fourth book, the last one, comes out this year. So I'm just, I'm just going to read all of them. And then I'm going to tell you about them. So look out for that. Now, I did mention at the start of this video that only one of the books on this list is actually ranked the book that came in at my number one slot. However, this book, the second to last book on my list, I feel like I couldn't rank it. I couldn't give it a rating. I just, it's so special to me and the reading experience of it was so precious to me that I, I, I kind of don't, I don't want to rank it. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want it to compete with anything. It just needs to exist on its own. And this book is also a book that I didn't talk about with you guys in 2020. I think I mentioned it a few times on my Patreon live streams, but I, I didn't mention it anywhere else because I didn't do very many tops and bottoms videos in 2020. And so this book never got the recognition that it really, really needed. So I'm very glad to be able to have it on this list and talk to you about it now. This is When I Had a Little Sister by Catherine Simpson and it is a memoir all about Catherine and her childhood and the relationship that she had with her sister, Trisha. In 2013, Catherine received a phone call from her father to tell her that her sister Trisha had died. She had committed suicide. Trisha had a series of mental health problems which the family had been dealing with or attempting to deal with and attempting to get her help for for her entire adult life and they were just consistently coming up against all of these horrendous roadblocks and inevitably Catherine believed that this was what was going to happen and yet when it did happen she was still so thoroughly shocked, shocked to her core that she couldn't get over it. So Catherine and her family then travel from Scotland where she now lives down to Lancashire to the family farm where Trisha grew up to clean out Trisha's home. But as she's cleaning out Trisha's home she finds a series of diaries that go all the way back to when they were little little girls to like to when they were like six or something like that. And as she starts to read them, she realises that Trisha's view of their childhood and of everything that happened in their lives is so much the polar opposite to Catherine's view of what happened that she realises that she didn't know her sister at all. She had no idea what was going on in her life and that realisation drove her to write this book. There is a discussion in this book about how traditional values and the attempt desperately to stop the erosion of traditional values has oppressed so many people. Catherine and her sisters came from this tiny, tiny village where they had a huge rambling farm and they didn't have a lot of influence from the outside world. And also this idea of all of our values coming from our parents and our idea of self-worth coming from our parents together work to make this narrative just it just it opened so many doors in my own brain about thoughts that I've had about my childhood and about the small town that I grew up in and the way that we see people from our past is people who are captured uh, forever in our memory as that person and we don't see any of the struggles that they've had and we don't see any of the ways in which they've changed themselves as a person we just see that person that's trapped in our memory and that was Trisha for Catherine she was trapped in her memory at different stages of her life but she never ever had a chance to see her as a whole person. Ugh, there are just so many layers to this book and it was just so good and it influenced me in so many different ways that I it will always have a special place in my heart although I do think it will be a while before I read it again because I think that this is one of those books where when you go away and you live for some more and you come back to it you will find more truths there inside it and I'm really looking forward to the day that I finally feel like picking it up again. And finally, in the number one slot, finally, the only book on this list that I have ranked above all other books in 2020, a shining beacon of light from 2020, is of course The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. How could we not 
I ask you, how could we not have the five? This is another book that I spent a really long time thinking about before I made this video because I don't know if it's possible to perfectly express all of the things that I think about it in such a short space of time, but I am going to try. Fundamentally, this book is a historical account of the lives of the victims of Jack the Ripper. Hallie Rubenhold is a historian and she realised that in all of the accounts of Jack the Ripper, in all of the sensationalist media that we have, in all of the museums that we have, in all of the numerous books about who Jack the Ripper was, we have never actually got a consistent, well-researched account of who the victims were. Polly, Annie, Elizabeth, Catherine and Mary Jane are all women that we know only by the tag of victim. We only know that they were brutally murdered and we only know the things that historically we have been told, that they were all prostitutes, that they were all people who were extremely down on their luck or were alcoholics and had made this choice, that they lived in one of the most notorious areas of London at a time where only the worst people lived. And what Hallie Rubin Hall discovered as she researched this book was that actually almost none of the things that we know about the victims were actually true. But what I've noticed is that in reviews of this book what most people seem to call it is a non-fiction historical sort of detective account of the victims. And instead what I suggest that we should think about it as is a true crime book because this is the kind of quality of true crime book that we should be demanding. These are the kinds of accounts that should be being published about modern cases where we have all of the information about the victims, where we have all of the access to living family members, where we have modern records, where we are actually able to piece together a life for this person beyond just the victims of so and so. I continually use Ted Bundy and books about Ted Bundy as an example but it's because I think that it is the most clear modern example we have of this myth of personality being created around somebody who has done completely morally reprehensible things in the same way that Jack the Ripper was simply a person who was skilled only at taking the lives of people who most people in society at the time were not paying attention to the existence of. That was the only thing that he did. Whereas these women who he killed had families, had accomplishments, had passions. True crime is in itself a genre which is incredibly problematic. When we are reading it we are choosing to consume the tragedies of other human beings and that's not to say that that is without merit but also we're not doing it from a place of a psychology student or from a criminal profiler's point of view and so the things that we should be focusing on are not the strange brain chemistries of the people who choose to do these things it is instead the narratives of the people that are left behind and how it changes our society and how it changes the consciousness of people who go through these horrible things and then are just left to deal with it. The people who once the cameras leave and once the media have given up on it are left to deal with these tragedies on their own. And I think this book does a really amazing job of advocating that. Hallie Rubenhold essentially says at various points in this book, this is the thing we should be focusing on. She is amazing and this book is amazing and I think every single person should read it. If you know the name Jack the Ripper and you have ever at any point been interested in any of the stories about him and what he did, this is definitely on your required reading list for life to correct the enormous imbalance that we have all grown up with. All the stars, just all the stars and all the pedestals and all the I will be pushing this book on people forever. And that's it! Those are my top 10 books of 2020. I feel a little bit cleansed being able to say that there were actually good things that happened in 2020. So as always, please tell me if you have read any of the books on my top 10 list. And of course, if you have made a top 10 list, then I want to see it. Leave it in the comments or link me to your video and I will go and I will add many things to my wish list because your girl is not buying books until the end of August. It's only the first week of January and it's already physically painful but I'm still not doing it because willpower and also the truly horrifying stack of books that I have to hold it's like just over there looking at me in the background.
If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing for more of my face. And I will be back with my worst books of 2020 video very soon because I have so many opinions about those books that I'm having to like cram them back in and like sit on them. And also, I don't know about you guys, but my 2021 has got off to a wonderful swimming start with books. I am in love with so many of them and just long may it continue. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. Bye!